All right. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Uh, François de Garry. Uh, I've been uh, with the GDG community for a while. Uh, almost started it. Uh, I was there for the first uh, meetup and uh, then uh, more recently left a bit. Uh, I, and you saw the reason. And <laughs> anyway, so um, I, when I suggested the, uh, the, the, the talk, Design Thinking, um, COVID was not existing. So um, most of the concept we're going to cover today are a bit harder to do with the COVID situation right now because uh, it was implying a lot of, um, of uh, proximity uh, uh, with the participants. And so I kind of refresh it uh, and try to put a, a, remote, a remote work uh, aspect and uh, try to reorganize a bit how we gonna can we can do design thinking but in a remote way uh, it's not perfect uh, it's still pretty more it more it's more complicated than uh, doing it in person but uh, bear bear with me I'm gonna flag where it's gonna <laughs> these things are not possible and now what can, can be done with the alternative uh, with the uh, comp calls and other stuff so let's start with this um, Gonna hope. Okay, so first of all, uh, I've put the two links, and I think I've put it in the chat a bit earlier. Let, um, so you can, I, I put the, the, the rights so you can comment. So if you have any ideas, anything that you think might be uh, improving the actual content of those slides, please put comments on the, those specific slides, and I'll, uh, it'll be a pleasure to uh, change the deck over those comments. Uh, same thing, I've put, uh, I'm going to pass through some tools that could be used to define ideas and uh, and what's not. It's the second link. Uh, same thing, put comments. Uh, let's try to improve and make a community toolbox uh, for these practice uh, of uh, design thinking uh, tool set. Um, hopefully, you can guys uh, get the, uh, the link. So for those of you that doesn't know what design thinking is, uh, it's basically a process where we can define uh, very uh, innovative solution to obscure or very hard to grasp pro problems. It doesn't have to be uh, especially for software solution. It could be almost anything. The, the process itself is just a way to foster creativity and people and work together toward the solutions. And all this based on user input and data from the user itself. It's super important to take and build up on the user, use this user-centric approach uh, to build solutions. So design thinking is really revolving around that concept. And uh, we're going to pass through that. So what's the advantage of design thinking? Well, first of all, it's user-centered design. Um, I don't know for you guys, but some sometimes we re often receive requirements from someone that thinks they know what the user need or what the user need to do. And it's it, it's. It's rare that the company would put forward the voice of the customer first and not the business imperative uh, as a requirement. So with this methods, all that will be built in the design will be based on user input. And this is the key, most important thing, because if you build something that is not aligned with the user need, you just investing in something that is might not be used or not useful. So user-centered design is a core value of this process. Um, the way it's going to be uh, evolving is also foster creativity of the members. Um, it, there's a, they took some uh, some tools and way of to, uh, of working that is from other creative pro pro process, and basically we're going to reuse those concepts to create a solution. Um, another beauty of that is since everyone is working together toward a solution, we share knowledge and issues and and um, a, a core base knowledge of the issues uh, that is now replicated in the mind of everyone participating to the process. Um, so sometimes th there's a, some, sign, some kind of silos that happen in companies. So there's the marketing team that have all those mar marketing concepts, but doesn't know really what the business is doing. So for them to sell something that they don't understand fully is harder. So when we create something with the, the marketing folks within the team and the engineers in the team, and and all the expert pretty much as a core team it removed those um those issues that the the, the knowledge transfers was not there and the, the silo vision of these people um it might seems to be very intense uh, process because it's going to be five days dedicated for that uh, to produce something uh but in the end it produced less meetings and less delay to go to market 
So it's really a good approach, uh, but it's really intense and it, it required people to be dedicated to the process. So we're going to see later on what's, the, uh, what's all of that, but you gain times at the end. And finally, it's really flexible and agile. And the output of what we're going to do in design thinking could be uh, the foundation of a backlog in the agile process. And it, this process will work super well for ambiguously defined project or solution, something that is hard to grasp, too complex to grasp. If it's just like a, like a cookie cutter solution, you don't need design thinking at all, unless you want to redefine everything. Uh, so use that for some complex project or something that is not defined yet. And well, the, the main issue here is, is that this is done working all together in the room towards a common goal, but COVID <laughs> entered the scene and that changed a lot of things. So we'll see a bit the steps and how we can uh, cope COVID-19 constraints. Now that everyone is remote, uh, remote and uh, how can, can we work all together without that uh, human interaction that is kind of important in that process. So this is the overall design thinking flow. First, we empathize. Uh, we gather the data on the field, uh, speak to the user, uh, investigate what they like, how, what's the pain. We, we gather as much as possible data. It could be also market data. Go on, uh, online, find reports, find any type of data that will be shared or used to define a solution later on. The important thing is most of the time, go on the field, go see the end user and speak in their environment. It's much more easier to understand their point of view when you're living the, the situation or the, uh, the problematic with uh, the problems with them. So super important to do to go out of your, the, <laughs> your office or your reality and go in their reality. Now with COVID, it's a bit harder, but we'll, we'll try to find some ways. Uh, so interview and all that, we, we all those steps, we, I'm going to pass through in more detail. So I'm just going to explain the overall uh, things. Uh, then we're going to define, based on all the information we gather, uh, we'll try to define who's the, what's the target, what do we try to achieve, what are their pain, gains, and start building a big story map where all the flow itself will be drafted. And then we, we're going to take some portion of that big, big overall view and try to define more precisely, make mock-ups, uh, design, ideate, uh, inspire each other in the process to, to create the best possible solution. And then we're going to build prototype, try to put on paper or on digital format what the ideas has been uh, that we, are, we, we got with this process. And finally, we're going to test with end users. And this is a critical part. We might uh, all agree this is the best way or to do something, but when the user is going to be using this as a paper prototype or digital prototype, uh, we're going to know if it does fit their, the, their needs or their reality. And if it's not fitting, then we go back to the define and redo the same process to try to define that based on the learning that we have. The idea here is really to fail fast and not go in a one direction, not influenced by this, yeah, the, the user input. So uh, I'm going to pass through all those in details, don't worry. So first, uh, let's do, uh, let's set the time and the space. Um, this is based on the this book here. I don't know if I used to make it but anyway, it's based on the sprints uh, from uh, Jake Nape. Nape, I'm sorry if I butcher your name, but anyway, <laughs> uh, it's a five day process, and uh, well, D zero is like probably going to take more than more than one day, but uh, on D zero you set up a team. Uh, you handle most of the, lo the logistic in order to create that um, that roadmap of the, the design thinking. So you're gonna invite, create the team, make sure that everyone is dedicated and available for this process. And then you're gonna put that on a on a time and say, okay, this this is the week we're gonna work from Monday to Friday, and please be 100% dedicated for that time spot. Um, on day one, you're gonna start by the end. <laughs> You're gonna set what's the long-term goals you want to achieve. What's the the what why we're doing this? What what we're trying to achieve with uh, this process? Then we're gonna map it out. Try to remove the complexity of this process and put post-its on a wall or digital wall, and then try to map the overall process. So this this is a whole day, and then we're gonna have ask experts. Maybe there's some gaps in what we're gonna try to define. So bringing expert of the systems or existing uh, way of working will help gather the, 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 the information required to map the whole process. 
And finally, we're going to pick a target um, on where is the most gain that we can do to define in the all story map. So um, let's say we are doing defining an e-commerce solution. Maybe uh, the most challenging part will be the buy flow. So let's work together all together for the next week on the buy flow itself, because we deem it's a sufficient enough challenge for us as a team uh, to tackle with. So you define a target, and on day two, we're going to start working on that. So day two is basically um, show all the information you gather from day one, speaking with stakeholders and all that, and try to solutionize or, let's say, make an abstraction of what you gather together. Uh, so I don't want to go too much in the details because I, I do pass all those steps. But basically, you start sketching the solution. You start ideating uh, first individually and then as a team and then all together uh, in order to define what could be a potential solution for the problem uh, the, the, um, the problematic. On day three, as a team, you decide what will be the main direction you're going to take. And then on, four, on day four, you just refine what you are going to produce to uh, make sure on day five you can test with actual user that will try your interfaces. So that's the overall plan, and we're going to pass through uh, those details. Um, this one was based on Sprint, uh, the book. And this one is more like the uh, generic uh, design thinking approach. It's pretty much the same thing. Uh, this one is a bit less um, precise, per se, but it's all the same steps. It's uh, basically you empathize, define, and blah, 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 and so on, until to the test, and go back to define at later point. So uh, one of the key thing in a most of companies to get a room a war room and this is uh super important that for the next five days this room is ours and the wall is going to be home by the team and it's going to be the big brain uh everything in the room will be uh will need to be staying in place because there's um i think in the book they say that the basically our brain has a much powerful uh Spa spatial recognition. And when you put something somewhere, you recall, oh, yeah, that user story, I recall I've put it in that area. So if uh, every morning you flush or change the environment, it's not going to work well for you guys. So basically, use the room as your main brain uh, for the whole team. So uh, you need to reserve a room for five days for that whole team and lots of whiteboard all across the place. So obviously, this was pre-COVID, everyone in the same room. Now, for uh covid friendly uh, approach uh, we need a virtual room so this is a bit more challenging but it's still feasible and actually um within bell we work a lot with toronto teams uh atlantic teams so we are already across the canada so it's hard to get everyone in a room uh, so we try to play a, a bit with the virtual room and it was working quite well to some aspects. So what we used was uh, Google Drive. <laughs> um, it's not always approved by corporate security. But anyway, it's so efficient that it's hard to <laughs> avoid it. But uh, you so use Google Doc, Google Slide, Google Draw. And it, there's even Draw IO that is integrated with Google Drive. There's also alternative like uh, Miro.com. Um, I'm sure you guys also have other white uh, whiteboards, virtual whiteboards that exist. Uh, at the end of this talk, let's talk together all the, all the tools I might I might have missed or it could be interesting to share. Um, the other thing is uh, like a virtual doc space where everyone is comfortable with where the information is and how to fetch it and, and update it. Uh, we need to own that virtual space to be efficient. So make sure that everyone knows and how to access. Uh, it will be sad that technical challenge uh, prevent people to collaborate in that space. And in the end, try to have some visual of the uh, like the virtual camera of the face because the nonverbal is super key, yeah? especially if you're the animator of the uh, of the sessions to see that people that seems they, they want to talk or not. It's super obvious when you are in a, in a room all together, but virtually it's a bit harder. As right now, I'm not sure I, I'm not able to see you guys. I, I don't know if there's any questions or if someone want to talk or add something. So. Um, the nature of virtual um, meeting is making it a bit harder. So anyway, so next, <clears throat> yeah, I just <laughs> uh, spoke about the virtual uh, room challenge. 
uh, the, this can be alleviated basically with uh, first make sure you know, everyone is uh, comfortable with the tools. Uh, the animator is well uh, versed with the tool itself as well, because sometimes uh, I animated a lot of uh, sessions and I, I, I'm the one putting post-its based on the, the feedback of people speaking. So it's sometimes more fluid if someone controls the, white, uh, the whiteboard and people just uh, freely speak uh, on the phone. Um, and basically, make sure to train the people with the tools. Uh, you can do icebreaker activities that are less critical uh, just to know each other and all that. Um, so let's speak about the team now. Uh, who's going to participate and how you create a best team? Ideally, it should be five to seven person. More than that, it brings some uh, logistic issues. Um, it, it's harder. Uh, the bigger the team, the, the, the bigger challenge uh, for everyone to speak, uh, to decide, everything. So uh, try to keep it small. Uh, ideally, they need to be 100% dedicated. Uh, this means uh, no other project or phone call. When they leave the room for two hours, they lose two hours of creativity, two hours of uh, uh, briefing. And to repeat to those person that left two hours, everything that happened is a loss of time for the whole team. So really, it's hard to achieve. But you can always put some space, uh, time where they can read their emails, uh, do some critical stuff that needs to happen. But if you are not 100% dedicated, it will just decrease the uh, the yield of this process. Ideally, you need to mix a, a, a expertise. Uh, you need someone for marketing, finance, uh, the uh, the engineers that knows the constraint, the technical constraint on how to create things. Uh, use UX expert, designer, uh, subject matter expert. All these people should be uh, key players in a team, and also a facilitator, someone that is at least saw this talk <laughs> or read about the subject uh, to steer people around those uh, the days that we saw on the calendar and, and build that um, that momentum to create uh, the uh, design, design thinking flow. Um, another thing is uh, the personality would be diverse and troublemakers are usually welcome in that. Troublemakers are not people that just want to disrupt things. They are just thinking outside of the box and and bring ideas that uh, might not be popular because it's not the way we are doing things in the past, but might inspire some different way of thinking or uh, disrupt a bit, uh, bring disruptive idea that could be a lead in the market and, and what's not. So uh, you need to create a safe space where ideas that are out of the box uh, are welcome. You don't, you don't, you don't need to, uh, to feel oppressed to bring something that the whole majority of people are not agreeing to. You need to be able to express yourself. And this is a key to bring something that is not, uh, that, that is different, let's say. Um, so yeah, diversity is the key. Now, uh, it's hard to, with seven person, to uh, cover every aspect of that. So you, you're going to bring also expert of subject. Uh, the thing is, those people are there to bring uh, their expertise on the table. Uh, for a short amount of time uh, to inspire the, the core team. So you bring the SME, speak with them 30 minutes about what you understand from the solution, what are their challenge and what's not. You take that and it's all your, your own to work with. So this is uh, how you bring outside expertise. Uh, for example, let's say we need uh, to put something on the, on the internet and uh, we need a, law, a lawyer to speak about GDPR uh, uh, within the uh, European Union. So we don't need him for the whole five days uh, pitching ideas. We could, but for this specific things, it could be a very narrow expertise that is required. Their inputs is required. But the constraint of that GDPR laws should be taken into account when we design stuff. But we don't need them for the whole process. So those are an example of a. Uh, subject matter expert that could be brought in the first phase of this project to uh, feed us with uh, constraint. Um, uh, so this is called the extended team. Oh, and one thing I, I'm almost forgetting is the decider. Um, what we need to avoid is someone that is not accountable or doesn't have the final say of the solution. We need someone that say, this is the way we're going to do it uh, and have the full authority to do it. Because the thing that could happen is that you 
the whole team is working super hard, find a crazy and nice solution. And the final VPs that is supposed to sign up for the project was not involved in the process and say, well, you know, you didn't you disregard that aspect and I'm not willing to give a go for this project. So you, you need to make sure that this team has at least one person that has the final authority to make it happen. Otherwise, you won't be able, probably, maybe not be able to sell this project uh, to the company you work for. So make sure that the decider is part of the uh, the process as well, and finance people just to make sure that it's it's viable. <laughs> um, so how do we start? Well, first of all, let's pick an idea, an issue. Like I said, uh, it, it could be broad. Even like a regular engineering, that software engineering could be part of the, using this process here. Uh, basically, it needs to be complex, but uh, uh, not too easy, because too easy, there's much more efficient process to do stuff. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is start with the end. What's the main goal? Why are we doing this? What, where are we going to do? want to be in six months, in one year? Why? Uh, so <laughs> this is key thing. You know, what's the end goal to achieve? And write it in big, bold fonts in the, on a the room or virtual room or, I don't know, in all the invites. <laughs> Uh, just so we, we keep as a, a beacon of where we are going, this needs to be defined. So start with the end. I agree as a team that this is the end goal we need to reach. So we set our mindset on reaching that goal. And when we then define the solution, we are always going to validate, are we aiming towards the right goal? So the first step now in the process that we have defined the goal is to, uh, to make the empathy phase. And empathy phase? empathize <laughs> so basically we need to understand uh, the hand user and what they are caring about so initially it was get out of the building meet their user on their well, life environment so if you're defining uh, forms for uh, clerks that do XYZ well you go meet that clerk in that in their office and see how they work they're going to explain you, oh, I'm doing this, uh, this is, and you ask questions. You go there as a journalist, and you basically try to be impartial, just gather and uh, siphon all the information that they can give you. Uh, ideally, you can split and divide your, the, the core team and different teams, uh, two or three persons, and, and then you're going to reconvene and share what you discovered. And uh, everyone, everyone should be taking those individually, and, and ideally in post is because uh, this works work best when we, we uh, when we're gonna gather together, we're gonna share those post is. And if a post is come uh, from every person of the group, you, you can bet it's damn important and this is a key thing to take care of. So uh, the reason of uh, splitting and taking individual notes is to make sure that to help sort out what, in sport, what is important and what is really uh, like more marginal. Um, at later point, you're going to do an empathy map Canva. So uh, this is the first template I'm going to show you. So I, I built another Google slide thing where there's uh, lots of um, layout masters where you can fill. And the beauty of these is that you can always work together um, uh, virtually. So you just copy paste that post it's, uh, whoops, that's the BDG logo. Uh, but ba basically, people just can uh, copy paste uh, when it works. My uh, usually it works quite well. Okay, yeah, there we go. So everyone can edit in real time those uh, those Canva and put ideas. Uh, and at some point, we're just gonna sort it out as a team. It's less fluid than uh, when it's a big whiteboard, but nonetheless, it's better than nothing. Uh, so what's the MPD Canva? It's just a a, a fine way to define what's uh, who, who is the person you're gonna. Who's the end user you're trying to uh, solve the issue for? Um, so there's a seven step. I'm not going to pass through all these. It's pretty well explained in the Canva itself. But basically, by answering all these seven questions, uh, you should be able to define what are the pain points that we need to uh, to be resolved, and what's the gain if you solve those pain points. And this is going to be the core thing to solve with the uh, overall solution. And it's going to be uh, the foundation of what you need to to get inspired to find a, a proper solution that fit those uh, those people, those users. 
And when we say it's a user-defined approach, this is the core foundation of that. You try to understand, empathize with these users in order to build on top of that. So for a mobile app, it's uh, what you are doing, uh, what are you trying to achieve? What's the, what, what's annoy you, uh, annoy, annoy, annoy you right now uh, to accomplish X, Y, Z? And you try to find a solution from that. So um, if you see all the solution out there right now, what's popular as a application, they try to solve issues or problems or bring value to the customer. So this is a way to, dis, uh, to for, sort out what's the value for their uh, specific need. So Empathy Canvas Map is, uh, I stole this from uh, gamestorming.com. There's plenty of nice uh, templates out there. Um, I've got the link in referen uh, reference at the end of this uh, talk, uh, but uh, it's a very nice Canva to try to narrow how to define a user. Okay, uh, so yeah, like I said, you gather all your notes, you put that together, uh, and you sort out what's the most important about uh, about them. Oops. Okay, so uh, now we need to try, usually we do this on site. Uh, now we need to try to do this virtually as much as possible with mask and all that. <laughs> uh, but the idea, you get the idea, the essence of that, uh, there's plenty of tools out there to do this remotely, but it's much more efficient in person. Um, also, this is the end user, very specific, very narrow to specific user, but there's also metadata that could be interesting. There's plenty of uh, website out there that contains a wealth of data. Uh, well, sorry, I didn't update the slide, but this one's for uh, initially intended for Bell audience. Uh, where we have a market research department that does have uh, lots of research uh, uh, from outside firm. Uh, but basically, uh, you have Statistic Canada that uh, provide generic information. Cifrio made some great uh, files about uh, end user and their opinions and what are the trends. There's Google Trends um, that you might know is basically uh, what people are searching right now on Google. It can give you ideas of what's, what, what's the most important between two concepts. Um, and basically, you can say, okay, uh, onward for tonight, guys, or a, a bit in advance, try to gather information and prepare a lightning demo. And a lightning demo is you try to synthesize in a two-minute format uh, presentation. And I'm looking at the time, and I'm very bad at that. <laughs> but basically, it's uh, try to, to fetch the information out there and try to what's the most important thing to fit in two minutes uh, that you're going to share with the rest of the team. So if you go on StatScan and you you find some crazy fact about your end user or target, um, those will make the mark. And other information that is not important, you keep it in your mind. Might be useful later on in the process, but don't put it in the lightning memos. You don't have enough time. So you really need to time box in something very tight uh, to keep just the filet mignons of information. Um, when we are trying to define the the overall map of the uh, um, the story map, or anyway, the gain, gain collectively a, a picture of the whole process. There's something called event storming that helps um, define a bit what's the overall topology of the events and what drive what and what are the system involved. It really define basically what triggers something, who are the users, and which systems are. Uh, receiving what information. So I, uh, I won't go through too much details, but you have a link uh, on my slide that did lead to the definition of event storming. But when people give you information, take notes, and later on try to do event storming with what you learn from the end users or architect or system experts or whatsoever. It's going to help lay down those main systems, main events, main things that needs to be defined. Um, another useful tool is um, when you're going to try to solve issues to the end user, they're going to give you pain points. But sometimes it's what they're going to give you is like uh, symptoms, not the root cause of their problems. So there is a way of doing um, uh, finding the root cause, and it's called the five whys. Um, traditionally, you just ask yourself why uh, five times. So let's say. Uh, I was late uh, for this appointment. Why? Oh, because I was in another meeting. Why? Because uh, it overlapped. Why? Well, because uh, we have too much information, didn't put enough time. Why? Because it, it was too blur. So after five whys, usually you find 
something very precise on hopefully <laughs> on why this happened so now as a team you can make the same thing for one issue that is known by all everyone's going to write down in post-its why it happens and basically you're going to put five post-its from one to five and you, you're going to you, you're going to um, write why this situation or problems happen and everyone's going to do it in a row uh, and at the end as a team we're going to gather together and say well which on all these post-its and idea which going to be most probably similar each other which one seems to be the more important and basically you're going to arrive with the root cause that's going to be the uh, the latest little post-it here uh, from the uh, problems that, that initially happened uh, so this is a nice template and you can also do it in a, in a google format way so everyone is putting their post-its and sometimes people are going to cheat and be inspired by issues that they get read on the other post-it while doing it it's uh this is a way to foster creativity anyway um so yeah and another way of doing this is the um it, not as a team but uh, alone by yourself in introspection um this one uh, is more like narrow in the in the um, in the way i'm gonna i don't think uh, i have enough time to cover that uh, anyway the th those templates are there and another way to find root cause analysis and be inspired of, because um, when you think of a, of a problem, it's all often useful to think in a team. Um, like, uh, what are machines or system causing this issue? And then, oh, give me ideas. Uh, is it the process we're using that's bad? Oh, give me ideas. Oh, yeah. Uh, is it the, um, the physical tools that we have? Or this is based on the lean uh, approach or... Um, Six Sigma uh, way of doing things. So th those are concepts usually more in the uh, engineering of uh, optimization and lean process, but it's really good to find problems or get inspired of uh, finding problems in the process. So the fishbone diagram is another way of finding uh, issues. So the idea of uh, finding the root cause is because you try to solve these issues and set the goals uh, uh, of resolving that issue. So it's pretty important tool here. Um, and the angle basically is to put all these observation in a big, big wall uh, and make a story, an experience map and story map later on. So the experience map basically, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, uh, but you put the um, on the left here the uh, users because uh, sometimes you have multiple users for uh, an issue and you put your observation. So when you, you were doing the empath empathy um, uh, investigation, you all wrote post-its. And then you lay it down on the wall itself, and ideally in a in a time uh, times uh, well from this is the first step and this is the last step. So the time go this way with this axis. Uh, so you try to make some swim lanes of the observation you do, and the little post uh, the the little red dot here is at some point we're gonna need to say okay what's we what are we gonna try to define or tackle next. And those little uh, red dots, it's called red, uh, dot voting, is a little post-its uh, in a round thing that uh, people can tell their opinion. You give one or three dots to everyone, and we say, okay, what should we define next? And everyone will put their little dot on something that think that it's most important, and they're gonna be uh, able, to, with that, we can see, clearly see this is uh, the most important post-it to work with uh, for the next phase. Anyway. Uh, it's a bit, it's a bit time uh, consuming to explain the whole experience map, uh, but uh, the um, another way of seeing that is the story map, which at this point we put uh, two axes: the time, which is a uh, year, and the priority. So the higher the post is, the high, uh, the highest priority is, and the lower is the we are coming in the nice to have. So we have those little swim line here that. Uh, Organize those post-its in a different uh, way, and, and basically you can regroup all those post-its in a cl little clusters, and these clusters will come teams or epics, uh, like in stories, where you can organize these things. So, based on the story map, you can make a backlog, an agile backlog, and uh, uh, and organize it in a way that everyone recall. Oh yeah, th those were the, these stories. So, I don't know. Hopefully, it makes sense to you guys <laughs> at this point, but. Uh, uh, anyway, 
So yellow stickers is observation, green stickers is teams that regroup those observation, and blue stickers is a step of the process, the overall process that we, uh, uh, we're trying to draft. So uh, yeah, so you're gonna draft that big map. We're now at day two of the, um, of the, uh, the process itself. Um, and now we need to narrow on something more specific for the next three days. So we can tackle the whole survey map and expect to make a prototype and everything functional, uh, especially if we pick a very complex project. If we didn't pick something too complicated, well, let's do the whole experience map uh, in one shot. But more realistically, you're going to need some something more narrow. So we proceed to the dog vote system and say, oh, we're going to tackle on that specific aspect. And at this point, we start the define phase. Uh, so we gather all these observations, and we should be able to uh, already have our, um, our um, canvas, our personas that was defined. Uh, and other things that is pretty interesting, so sometimes we always focus on, uh, on the problem itself. Oh, this isn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't work, it's not efficient, blah, blah, blah. The, the issue when we focus on the negative aspect of something is we, we don't think about solution. So a simple trick of the mind to think about solution and be more creative is to, um, to avoid say, oh, this is a problem whatsoever. How can we, we use the, formula, the formulation, how can we do X, Y, Z? So let's say uh, we need to increase cell. We don't have enough cell, blah, blah, blah. How can we increase cells? And it's a call to, <laughs> to action on how can we fix that issue? And our brain start, oh, can, how can we, oh shit. Uh, sorry, uh, how can we find a solution to that? So it's it set our brain in another mode than just, oh, yeah, it's really bad. Blah. So it, 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 it cheer up the whole group and find solutions. So that's a very little simple trick, but it's uh, quite efficient. Okay, so um, yeah, so we we do the NPETI canvas that we spoke about, but we need to focus on three specific personas. More than that, it's going to be a mess. So you try to define who's the most important user. We try to aim a solution. Um, and you lay out that personas. And for now on, we are defining a solution for these guys. Put the name of the person. Oh, so this is Bob. Bob is a system admin, is a, is overwhelmed with the complexity of the, those requests you receive, blah, blah, blah. So let's find a solution for Bob. How can we help Bob find a solution? And which we. At the end of this process, we're going to love Bob. Oh, we're going to help him. So uh, it's, it's good to empathize and make some uh, like clear idea of who's Bob and why we're doing this. Um, yeah, and what's the attribute of Bob? So uh, let's define Bob. Bob is good at computer. Oh, Bob is not good at computers. Let's define more precisely uh, what, what are the challenges of Bob and who is Bob. So we have a clearer mind of what uh, the challenges are. Um, okay, so now we are at a bay, <laughs> uh, and I, I don't know if people are asking questions. Let me just, okay, uh, anyway, so Laurence, if you can just monitor the, uh, the, uh, the, the talk or anyone that uh, follow the, uh, the chat and stop me with, uh, unmute yourself and just say, by the way, there's questions because, uh, it's starting to feel like a monologue. <laughs> Anyway, so we're now at the ideate phase. Um, and, and at this point, we're going to build something. We're going to try to make interfaces, make something uh, more um, specific. Initially, on the design thinking, it was paper prototype. There's two good reasons of paper prototype. First, it needs to be looking a bit raw, like uh, raw ideas. Because if we're making a lot of time making nice interfaces, and we're going to waste time of just not the essential. The essential is understand if the flow makes sense, if the interface makes sense, because we're going to test with end user. And if the user see a very nice interface, they might bother on or give you feedback on stuff that is not really relevant to the main issue we try to solve. And also, it's much faster to produce and written prototype. Uh, the thing is, when we do it in paper, well, we it's not digital. So we, uh, I'm, I've got a slide later on on how we can do this paper prototype with a software because uh, we cannot share paper together. 
But anyway, so the uh, the idea is really going to use those paper things to define what we try to do. And one nice creative way of doing this is first, uh, you split your, let's say we say we have two hours to define prototypes. It's not a lot of time, so you need to organize yourself. The first 20 minutes should be gather personal notes on a sheet of paper. You just write down what you think is the most important thing, what you uh, recall of the two those two days, three days of work, uh, that it should be essential on what we're trying to solve. Next, you try to doodle, you, you draft, just go crazy on the paper. You, you don't put any restriction. Just put ideas out there uh, loosely on the paper. Then um, you're going to do a crazy aid. So you fold the paper like in fourth. Uh, you see the picture on the step three here. Uh, the idea is to create eight little box where you're going to try first a best shot of the idea you have for a specific interface. And then you're going to force yourself on creating seven other ideas to solve the same, exact same thing. So it's just to force yourself to think differently than what might be the first uh, the first shot that you uh, first idea you have. It's just to force creativity there. And by the way, all this is done alone by yourself. Everyone on the team is doing the same thing as you for the next two hours. And at the end, you look at the crazy eight, and there's might be one of the candidates there that seems to be more efficient, more um, near the reality that could you're not going to be ashamed to show to the, the rest of the team. So you take that idea and try to make it a, a bit more IRS with more details and try to think about what could be the solution and what you're going to present to the rest of the team. So you, you sketch up. So you put a bit more time on that uh, refinement. But basically, this is a step to create and foster creativity here. Then you're going to share these things to, with the rest of the team. So everyone has those ideas out there. Uh, we're going to do lightning talks. We're going to put on the wall, put on the virtual uh, room, those uh, those SketchUp, and people, you, you have two minutes to explain your concept and inspire others about your concept. And we're going to do also dot voting at the end to say, hey, I think we, these are the best uh, prototype we, and we should all um, go in that direction because we, as a team, feel this is the most uh, interesting idea. So the dot voting on those product, paper prototype or virtual prototype will be used for the next round. And the second round is basically we, we try to um, sway in the what has been defined and we do the same processes and we try to refine that. It could be also individually or as a team of two or three, and we try to refine a bit better. The end goal of that is create a uh, um, uh, much higher resolution and a, a, a fully complete prototype to be tested on the last day. So you take the remaining time to make sure that this prototype can be given to an actual user that's going to use it and understand what's going on. So at this point, I'm sure there's going to be gaps on uh, how you're going to use that. So you make sure to draft out, let's say you need to put some uh, configuration aspect. Well, define those configuration view. Make sure that you all those gaps are there and physically um, present in your prototype so that the end user is understanding the overall thing that needs to happen. I know it's a lot to, to digest, but do the IP path on EB path and, and adjust uh, um, uh, this process. The end goal is really that on the next day, we have someone coming in the office or virtually coming and going to test that. So it needs to be a, ideally a feature complete prototype for the what we try to achieve, not the whole solution, but at least the, the flow that we aim to, uh, to solve at this uh, design thinking process. So the last day is really uh, tests with actual end users. So um, there's animation there. It's just that it shows you like a paper prototype, and you are basically the, 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 the computer and changing the views with papers. You need to be organized with that. Uh, now with Balsamic, there's also a way, easy way to, uh, to do the same thing, but in a digital format. And basically, you go in a, a conf call like this, and you give the control to the user. And you say, hey, please use the app. And you give them tasks to accomplish. Hey, please pick uh, pick a shop to, uh, to um, or I don't know, <laughs> try to achieve the goal we try to do with the, or solve uh, the issue we try to solve here. And you see how he interacts. Um, ideally, you can get a feed of their face so because the, the nonverbal aspect of the face is uh, a key uh, to understand if he's struggling or he's happy or uh, confused or what's not. So, 
the human aspect is pretty important here because it's um, sometimes people will not share uh, naturally what they think really think so this is where design people or ux folks um, might be shining a bit more than uh, system engineers because they they, they they are used to do this type of uh, surveys um, so you observe you get the fat you gather the feedback and in the end you gather all what you learn in the, that specific week. So it's been five days, you're defining, and everything that has been produced is now stick on a wall or in a virtual uh, space, uh, and can, it, it's not lost. I mean, it's uh, it's gonna be used for the delivery team to actually deliver that things because we are defining. And at this point, we need to know, do we have enough information to move on in a delivery phase, like the real thing, or there's, so many unknowns that is remaining that we need to do another five days. So there is a, a pivot that needs to happen. Yes, we're ready. We have all the answers that we were looking for for the main goal that we fixed at the beginning of this process. Or no, we need to define this thing. And this thing could be totally different or the same thing because we're not happy with, with the end result uh, based on the observation. The user were confused. So we need to redo our work. And now we have other data to build and something different that we uh, we initially made. So uh, we go back to the define, ideate, prototype, and test. So it, it could be faster, but not five days, because we already made the empathy. Uh, we update maybe the information that we gather in the last week. But this is the cycle that needs to happen. And every time we end the cycle, we have more content, more ideas, and we are also aiming towards a better goal uh, that should uh, reach the target audience. So that's the uh, the overall process. Uh, I feel that I uh, I made more templates that I cover in this talk. So uh, feel free to look at the in the template things. Uh, also visit gamestorming.com. There's plenty of tools uh, that are uh, evolving around brainstorming as a team. Um, and yeah, to learn more, there's plenty of uh, nice little uh, learning. Uh, uh, videos and LinkedIn, and there's the uh, the book sprint uh, from uh, Jack Nate that is uh, really uh, interesting to read, and Change by Design by Tim Brown. Those are very interesting resources if you want to uh, go deeper in that. Uh, I would suggest if you're uh, you are willing to change your organization to adopt this uh, type of process to uh, really buy the sprint uh, book, and follow it because it's a cookbook, step by step. Uh, how to bring that process alive in your company. So uh, a big organization like Manulife, it might not be easy to um, to change those uh, old way of doing BRDs and what's not. So uh, I think it would be helpful to read that, uh, at least to help uh, change the culture of the company itself. Um, now I spoke uh, a lot. <laughs> Hopefully you guys now, uh, you can unmute yourself and share maybe uh, what are the collaboration tools you're using or any comments on the you want to share to the group or stuff that you, you would like to dig more on that? So uh, let's do a Q&A and a share session here. <laughs> 